The Bizarre Case of Dwight Jones In 2018, a series of spree shootings shook Scottsdale, Arizona. The perpetrator, Dwight Lamone Jones, seemed to be on a mission fueled by revenge. He terrorized the valley over four days, gunning down his targets in a rage that stemmed from something that happened 12 years ago. Welcome to Lavender City. If you're new here, we would love to have you as a subscriber. And before we start, we would like to mention that our thoughts go towards everyone involved who fell victim to the horrible actions of Dwight Jones. Trigger warning, the video may contain graphic details and instances of gun violence, domestic violence, and shootings. Dwight Jones and Connie met in 1984, and it was love at first sight. Connie, who was 18 at the time, was on a summer break after her freshman year at Wake Forest University. Dwight, who was 22 then, was enlisted in the US Army and stationed at a base in Fort Bragg. In an interview that aired on NBC's Dateline, Connie recalled that Jones was a gentleman soldier. While he wasn't academically inclined, he only had a high school GED. He had big ambitions and dreamed of being a lawyer. He was also her first boyfriend, took the role seriously, and was super protective of her. When Connie enrolled at the University of North Carolina to pursue a career in medicine, he quit the army to be with her. The following year, the couple got married and moved to Texas, where she pursued a dual residency in radiology and psychiatry. Her beau, on the other hand, seemed unable to hold down a job for more than a few days and frequently had arguments with his supervisors. A few years into the marriage, Connie began to see Dwight's true colors, and not only did he seem indolent and authority-averse, but also seemed to be mentally ill. According to Connie, he would frequently abuse her mentally and verbally. He wouldn't leave the bed for days when he was depressed. Despite her encouragement to seek help, he vehemently refused. In 1997, she gave birth to their son while she was pursuing a fellowship in breast imaging. Dwight's mental state improved significantly and the family relocated to Scottsdale, where Connie began a flourishing career as a radiologist specializing in breast imaging, a lecturer, and an educator. However, Dwight's problems and behavior only worsened from here. His penchant for verbal abuse escalated into physical violence. According to the Maricopa County divorce records, in 2007, he struck Connie and broke her sternum. In 2009, he pinned her to a couch by placing his knee on her chest. When she tried to leave, he threatened to kill both her and their son. Soon, she resorted to sleeping with a knife underneath her pillow and placed recorders in several discreet locations around the house to capture evidence of violence. In a press conference, she later recounted that her husband was a troubled man and that if she would leave him, he would kill her. She also stated that he had contemplated murder-suicide for the family. The tension between the couple reached a breaking point on May the 6th, 2009. Dwight was berating his 11-year-old son for his subpar performance at his school's basketball practice, and Connie intervened. As the argument grew heated, she started to record the conversation. He was shouting at her and threatening to drown her in the pool outside. Dressed in pajamas and a robe, she dialed 911 from the garage and waited with bated breath for the police. Dwight had locked himself inside the house with his son, and after an hour-long standoff with the Scottsdale police, he walked out using his son as a human shield. He was arrested on multiple charges and forcefully admitted to a psychiatric facility. Six days later, Connie filed for divorce, an event that would trigger a messy, contentious marathon of denial and recrimination that would drag on till late 2010, when she was granted full custody of their son. For years, anger boiled inside Dwight. His mind became consumed with the thoughts of his bitter divorce from his wife, the lost custody battle, and the vile thought that the family court system was corrupt. The combination of these factors would lead him to take some drastic measures. Thursday, May the 31st. The gunshots started just as another hot Phoenix summer day melted into a cool evening. Forensic psychiatrist Stephen Pitt stepped out of his office in an ivy-covered stone building in Keeland after another day of work. He had made plans to meet his fiancée, Natalie Collins, to meet after work and texted her that he was just 10 minutes away. 
sadly, he wouldn't make it. Pitt was something of a celebrity. He had made headlines by consulting on some high-profile cases, including the unsolved murder of John Bennett Ramsey and Phoenix's baseline killer case. However, the bulk of his work was focused on high-paying divorce cases, less sensational criminal cases, and custody battles. Since his career was devoted to studying some of the most unhinged criminals in the world, he reassured Natalie that he would never be a target. He believed that an attacker would rather go after a judge or attorney, and if someone did choose him as a target, there would be warning signs. Yet, on that fateful day, he was gunned down without any warning whatsoever, right outside his office. Witnesses claim that a round-faced man with big bags under his eyes, who was wearing a short-brimmed black cap, had approached Pitt as he walked to the parking lot where his car was. An argument ensued, followed by a series of gunshots. A witness caught a brief glimpse of the attacker as he ran away. She described him to the police sketch artist as a white male. Friday, June the 1st, paralegal Valeria Sharp stepped out of a small family law office in downtown Scottsdale into the sunlight of a cheery summer afternoon. But something was amiss, as bystanders were about to find out. She stumbled towards the door of a silver party bus parked at the curb, clutching her face as blood dripped down from a gunshot wound to her cheek. She banged the door, asking for help, right as her bloody handprint dripped down the glass door. The driver called 911, but it was too late. She was dead before the paramedics had arrived. Emergency responders followed a trail of blood into the low, salmon-colored office from where Valeria had emerged. Inside the law firm, they found another paralegal, Laura Anderson, crumpled on the floor. She had been shot twice, once in the back and once in the chest, as she had tried to run away from her attacker. The scene was chaotic. The shooting could have been related to anything from an unhappy client or a domestic violence situation involving one of the women. Or worse, the shooter could have been looking for someone else at the law firm. Divorce attorney Elizabeth Feldman, one of the partners at the firm, Bert Feldman Grenier, scurried to the office as soon as she heard about the shooting. When investigators asked her if she had used Stephen Pitt in any of her cases, she turned white. As it turned out, she had, in one very high-conflict case nearly a decade ago. Connie lived in fear of her ex-husband for nine years during the divorce proceedings. After the 2009 confrontation at their home in Scottsdale, she took out four separate protection orders against her husband, whom she referred to as her personal terrorist. She had hired divorce attorney Elizabeth Feldman for her case. Pitt was also a central actor in the Joneses' divorce case, as Connie and her attorneys had hired his expert services to do a risk assessment of Jones, hoping to bring light to his violent, unpredictable tendencies. He had determined that Dwight had anxiety and mood disorders, was antisocial, narcissistic, and paranoid. He concluded that without psychiatric intervention and treatment, his mental state would continue to worsen, and he would likely become psychotic, posing a great risk for perpetuating his violent tendencies. Connie paid Pitt more than $25,000 for the evaluation, an amount that implied a bribe to depict him as unstable in Dwight's eyes. Though Feldman gave the investigators the name of the killer within the first few hours of the shooting, he wasn't the only suspect. Another attorney at the firm, Sandra Burt, had used Pitt in one of her pending divorce cases, and the husband was a bald, white male who matched the sketch of Pitt's killer. At 9pm that day, the police got their first big break. The three shootings were tied together with .40 caliber shell casings found at both scenes. But just an hour after killing Sharp and Anderson, the shooter would walk into another nondescript building just seven miles away. In the counseling office where his next target worked, he was dejected to find that the woman he was seeking had gone home. That didn't stop him. Instead, he shot the 72-year-old psychologist Marshall Levine in the face twice. The police wouldn't be called in till late that night when Levine's fiancé found him kneeling on the ground with his head and upper body on the couch. Though his fiancé thought it was a suicide, police realized it was a cold-blooded execution. Saturday, June the 2nd, Phoenix police had a spree killer on their hands and a long list of suspects they had to narrow down soon. The legal community was on edge, 
and everyone thought they would be the next victim of this mystery shooter. The police were trying to make sense of the bits and pieces of information that they had. Then, Connie left a message on the tip line. Sunday, June the 3rd. When Scottsdale detective John Heinzelman reached Connie on her phone that morning, she reassured him that she was safe in a secluded mountain property outside Flagstaff. Her current husband, Rick Anglin, who was a former Phoenix police detective, was with her, along with her college-aged son. The couple had just returned from a cruise that had possibly saved their lives. She told the detective that her ex-husband Dwight Jones was the shooter, as all the places targeted had something to do with the people who represented her in the divorce case. The divorce had been hard on their son, so Connie had taken him to see psychologist Karen Colby. She was intended to be his fourth victim, but since she had left for the day, Dwight shot Levine, who was subletting half of her office. Connie told Heinzelman that the next target would likely be Paulette Selmy, who had performed the custody evaluation. She had made the final call and limited Dwight's contact with his son to supervised visits. Jones stopped visiting his son a few years after the divorce and continued to reside in an extended stay hotel in Scottsdale. He had never moved into a permanent residence since 2009 and his only worldly possession was a gold Mercedes that he had won in the divorce. Using these leads, police began searching for Dwight and set a tail on him. On reviewing surveillance video from the shootings, they were able to spot his distinct Mercedes at two of the crime scenes. They tracked his cell phone data to a house in Fountain Hills, where his car had been spotted between 12 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. Inside, police discovered the bodies of 70-year-old Mary Simmons and her longtime boyfriend, 72-year-old Byron Thomas. Neither of the victims had ever been in the legal field or in any way connected to the case. The only connection was that Dwight used to play tennis with Simmons occasionally, but the reason soon came into the picture. The .22 caliber Beretta handgun that Dwight had dumped in a trash can near Scottsdale Road and Shea Boulevard earlier that day belonged to Thomas. Meanwhile, the DNA sample from Jones's son matched the thumbprint on the casings, connecting Dwight to all six murders. Monday, June the 4th. It was barely dawn when Scottsdale and Phoenix police started evacuating the guests from the extended stay hotel where Dwight was residing. Jones, who was wearing a black shirt bearing the symbol of the Punisher, spotted the tactical officers and opened fire at them from the window of his second-story room. Then, he turned the gun on himself. While he didn't leave behind a suicide note, his entire room was a strange museum to the divorce that had consumed him. Apart from a Glock 22 and a semi-automatic rifle, police found numerous disguises including fake facial hair, hair, rounds of ammo and knives. They also found a white mask that matched the one in the 18 videos on his YouTube channel where he had outlined the so-called conspiracy against him. All 10 hours of video focused on the same thing. He had been robbed of his son. On an envelope, he had scrawled the names of his four targets, Selmy, Colby, Pitt, and Feldman. There was no rock-solid trigger behind his murderous rampage. He could have been running out of money. He was withdrawing $3,000 per month with no source of income. He could have been triggered by the fact that his son wanted nothing to do with him. Connie stated that his death was the best result of this ordeal and that she hoped that he would finally get what he deserved. That's all for today. Do you think Dwight Jones could have been caught sooner had the witnesses identified him correctly? Comment below. If you enjoyed the video, give it a big thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and smash the notification bell to not miss a single video from us. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.